All right, CMT 120, Chapter 1. We are now in the section talking about some topologies. So I'm going to break these out. The book mentions them kind of real briefly. I'm going to break them out and give you a little bit more detail to give you a little bit of background um, that can be helpful. So bus topology, um, this was the early, early days of Ethernet networking. Um, you had a single cable that all the devices in the network connected to. Uh, there was really no intervening connectivity devices. It was basically one shared um, channel, one shared cable that everything was connected to. In these days, it was coaxial cable. So if I take a look here, um, here was the kind of the brainchild behind that. Bob Metcalf was the one that was the, the brainchild behind the Ethernet network. And this was his early concept. This was his drawing that he made of how are we going to move data between computers on this network that eventually became called, became, uh, called Ethernet. And his concept was, hey, we're going to tap into this central cable, this ether. We're going to tap into this central cable and all the devices will tap into it and move data across, move electrical signals back and forth across this um, to share data. So we had coaxial cable. Um, there were terminators at the end, these, these resistors that it basically act as like a shock absorber to absorb that electrical signal so it didn't bounce back into the network. Um, and, the, and the signal would travel endlessly between the two network ends, if you will. Uh, actually, if you didn't have those terminators, the signal would bounce back and forth between them. So in here, that's where you have these little like T's on the end to 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 indicate we need a terminator on the end uh, to make sure that signal does not bounce around. Well, here was the super early Ethernet. There was literally the thick coax cable that a transceiver would bolt around. And in here was a, a, a screw that would literally cut through the insulation, make contact with a copper wire inside. Um, and that would tap into the network, hence the nickname Vampire Tap. Um, these were, these, this early, early Ethernet was called a Vampire Tap because like a giant fang biting into the network. Um, these devices and the computers would connect to that transceiver. So this computer is sending a signal into the coax cable through that Vampire Tap. This computer is sending a signal into the coax cable through its Vampire Tap. And if I drew a map or a diagram of the network, this is what it looked like. All the devices were literally tapping into that network, and it made a bus topology. Um, sometimes you will see this symbol symbol on the on a computer indicating that there's a link or activity. It would actually show like a little mini bus network. This is how Ethernet started. Um, it it eventually. Uh, it got a little bit more easier to connect. They used a thinner coax cable and T connectors. Um, so the T connectors would cl uh, clip onto or, or screw onto the NIC on the back of the computer. Um, actual network interface card on the back of the computer made it a little bit easier to connect. But again, it was still connected in this fashion. The computers were all connected into this bus network. In these days, when a computer wanted to send data from A to B, Okay, when to send, you know, from this computer here to this computer here, it would send a signal out onto the wire and it would literally go to everybody because there is no traffic control device in here. There was no switch or router or anything like that. It didn't exist yet. There was no traffic controlling device. So as that signal left the computer, it went to everybody in the network and the correct person would pick it up and go, oh, thanks. I appreciate that. Thanks for that file. All the other devices in the network would go, I don't know what this is. It looks like junk, and it would throw it out. So mission accomplished. We got data from A to B, but what a mess. What a mess. Everybody else got the data too. But that was the first Ethernet networks using this type of arrangement, connecting all the devices together into the central coax bus, giving us this bus topology. That's how Ethernet started. And again, this is, you know, uh, brainchild Bob Metcalf, and here was his drawing of this is how we're going to move data on this network. Um, a lot of times you'll have a cleaner drawing like this showing the devices sending a signal out on the wire and going to everything. And the terminator on the end, that little, uh, uh, it's a resistor inside of that, would grab that signal and not let it bounce back into the network. So as the signal got to the end, the terminator would grab a hold of that electrical signal and kind of use it up and not let it bounce back into the network. That was the job of the terminator in the end. Um, it was relatively inexpensive to hook up. I remember hooking, uh, helping hook up a bus topology uh, Ethernet network in a middle school I worked in. 
uh, in the mid nineties, um, down in Maryland. It does not scale well though. As the more computers you add, the more traffic you add, the more of a mess it becomes. It is difficult to troubleshoot and it is not very fault tolerant at all. Um, so most networks moved away from that in due time. Most networks moved away from that in due time. Now, pause for a second. Again, this was Ethernet back in the, you know, 70, actually more like the 80s ballpark, 80s ballpark, maybe 90s, 80s, 80s, 90s ballpark. Um, at the same time, remember IBM, Apple, all these other companies were doing their own thing. Um, at this time, IBM was doing its network. And its network was a token ring network. So they ended up using a ring topology. So the devices connected to each other, next to each other, in a ring fashion. So instead of everything being spread out in a bus, IBM had the devices connected in ring. And it worked in the fashion of um, a little data token would circle the network, almost like a, think of it almost like a uh, shuttle bus driving around the city. If, if that little token was empty, you could put your data in, it would carry it around and drop it off. Um, and then it would circle again, and when somebody had data, they would plop it in that little token, that little shuttle bus, if you will. It would deliver it around the network to its nodes. Now, most people look at this ring like I did once upon a time, going, what the heck is going on? Well, what actually was being used was this multi-station access unit. So... Physically, the devices were connecting up like you have down here. All the devices were plugging into this multi-station access unit with a cable. But the circuitry, the circuitry inside of here, was literally passing the token out to the computer and then back. Out to the computer and back. Out to the computer and back. Out to the computer and back. So if I follow it through, if I follow this the whole way around, it ends up making a giant ring, a giant loop. So inevitably, you end up with this as your topology. That's what IBM was doing with its token ring to connect its network together. Xerox was using Ethernet to connect its computers together. Meanwhile, IBM was using token ring to connect its computers together. Side note, the college was a uh, hack college network was hooked up as a token ring until um, late 90s, early 2000s, that ballpark. Um, so this is not something from the dinosaur ages of computers. Um, most places don't use this anymore, but it is something that places did use as their network technology. Uh, the advantage of this, there was no collisions because it was that little shuttle bus thing. You know, uh, the, the shuttle bus was driving around delivering, delivering the data to its, to its intended destination. Um, the downside, though, was a malfunctioning workstation could disable a network. Um, it's not flexible or scale because the, the more computers you add, the larger that ring gets, the slower the traffic moves around that. Um, again, yeah, the more wait time between. So many places migrated away from that. All right, again, that was in the 70s and 80s, more like the 80s ballpark. Ethernet evolved from the bus eventually into the star. Okay, Ethernet evolved from the bus into the star. Um, our Ethernet networks today do not look like, I'll go back here again real quickly. Our Ethernet networks today do not look like this. Our Ethernet networks today look like, this. This is what our Ethernet looks like today. So our Ethernet migrated away from the bus and into the star. Well, the star, here we go, um, star topology, all the devices are connected to a central, all the network, all the computers are connected to a central device, a hub or a switch. Initially it was a hub, today it's now a switch. Um, most Devices are connected together with twisted pair cabling. Um, your twisted pair cabling, your patch cable that you're using at home, that's twisted pair cabling. So most of my devices are connected like so. A twisted pair cable going from the back into the hub or switch. Uh, twisted pair cable coming from the computer into this into the switch. This is a little bit better picture. You can see this a little bit better. There's a l individual cable coming from every computer into this hub or switch. Now, this added some advantages over the bus topology. Let's go back here to the bus topology real quickly. Here's my bus topology. Everybody's connected in that central coax. Um, there's nothing there acting like a traffic comp. You go first, you go second. Um, if I have a problem with this computer, it, it, it literally can affect the whole network. Okay. So when we move on to the star topology, 
all these devices have an individual cable coming into this initially hub. The advantage we have here is there's an individual connection for each device. So let's just follow that through real quickly. If this computer has a problem with its cable, it only affects this computer. This is not a ring where they're going from port to port to port anymore. So this this cable right here, if there's an issue with it, it only affects that, that device, that computer. So we already have kind of the thing of it only affects one device if I have a problem. Secondly, I start getting little link lights over these ports now. Prior to that, you did not have link lights over these little ports. They didn't exist. Uh, once these hubs come along, you start getting little link lights above these ports. Now I have a way to actually start doing a little troubleshooting. You know, ah, look at the look at the link lights. Ah, it looks like nine is not lit up. It looks like there's a problem with this computer. Let's go track that down. So we now have some administrative advantages, network admin advantages. Um, you know, cable problem here, it only affects that computer. I can replace that cable, plug it in, it's good to go. Um, I start getting little link lights here, yay. But initially the hub, initially the hub right here is a layer one device, which we'll talk about a little bit later. When a piece of data gets sent in from a computer into this hub, it literally repeats it to all nodes. It repeats it to all nodes in the network. So when these networks were first hooked up with a hub, which they were, when this computer here sent data into the hub, this hub repeated to all other computers. So functionally, it worked the same as this bus topology. When this computer sent a, net, a piece of data on the network, it went to everybody. With a hub in the star topology, one data from this computer went into the hub, the hub repeated to everybody. So data-wise, it functioned the same way as the bus, but I had the advantage of these little link lights and individual connections to every computer that was a big step forward for managing the network. Well, luckily, we don't use hubs anymore. Okay. I remember back in the late 90s, early 2000s, um, I had a gentleman from the uh, uh, the Navy Depot come over and give a talk to my, my high school networking students about their plan to upgrade all the hubs in the network with switches. And we were all sitting there kind of googly-eyed with our mouth open, like, wow, this is exciting. This is late 90s, early 2000s. Um, we were all like quite excited, like, hey, cool, this is neat, upgrading everything to switches. Well, switches are a layer two device, which again, we'll talk about a little bit, that has a little bit of intelligence. So the switch actually tries to learn what computer is attached to what port. It tries to learn the address of that computer, called the MAC address. It tries to learn the address of that computer, what's attached to what port. So when this computer sends data into the switch, it goes, well, where are you trying to go? Oh, you're trying to go to that computer. It only sends device the, the data to that computer. It doesn't send to everybody. It only sends to that one computer. I think I have another example here. Hub was sharing everything. The switch is now dedicating. It's trying to get this computer to talk to this computer. And the advantage now is if you see here the color lines, this computer can talk to this computer. This computer can talk to this computer. At the same time, this is talking to this one. So the switch could have multiple conversations going at once when the hub could not. So when these networks moved from bus, when Ethernet moved from bus to star, we got the advantage of the individual connections and link lights, yay! But when we move from hub to switch, we now increase the capability of data moving through my network and the switch is now allowing multiple conversations to happen simultaneously. So the overall efficiency of my network, when we went from the ring to the star and the star with the hub to the using the switch, the efficiency of my network went up dramatically. So there's a real quick overview of my topologies along with this idea of the hub and the switch in there. Hub is my older technology. Switch is what we're using now in my networks for those reasons I mentioned. It's trying to get individual connections between my devices so multiple conversations can have it happen at once and we can get an overall uh, higher level of throughput through my network.